right. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, unusual event, unusual times, uh, unusual ways of presenting. Um, okay, my name is Venkat. Um, I work at Razorpay as an architect. Uh, been with Razorpay for about four and a half years. Uh, I started my journey with Adobe, uh, with with Yahoo for about uh, five and a half, six years. Uh, then went on to co-found my own startup, Razorpay is my fourth startup. That's been a bit of brief about what I've been doing. Uh, so interestingly, all through my career, uh, one way or the other, um, uh, at, at Yahoo, elsewhere, uh, things like Hadoop, uh, variety of different open source uh, uh, initiatives, I think. Um, uh, barring some college times, I think for the last 15 years, I just have uh, uh, Ubuntu laptop, officially sometimes Mac. Uh, uh, so never really dabbled outside open source so uh, uh um, in, a, in a in a very substantial fashion that's a bit of brief about uh, uh where i come from uh, what's been my little uh, uh contribution slash uh, uh work in the community uh with that in place okay so i just want to give a bit bit of brief i mean so this talk we're largely going to be focusing on uh contribution of open source uh and uh, towards at least you know or the impact of open source towards uh fintech organizations very specifically for companies like ours uh, uh like razorpay um and before we get into that uh, uh, just a brief about what razorpay does um so we're building payments in, uh, and your banking infrastructure for um, all of india as we speak uh so what is razorpay we are transforming the way the business finance runs uh business uh, financial uh, work runs uh it, we are a full stack payments and a banking company uh, we power basically uh, every kind of money movement uh, at every single leg um, of uh, uh, you know of the financial uh, ecosystem in the country, which basically means we accept money, we process money, we disburse money, and we do through, we do this through a variety of different things. Uh, very recently, in the last couple of years, we have introduced something called as Razorpay X and Razorpay Capital, which are potentially uh, transforming the way uh, businesses are uh, being run. And to sort of give you some numbers, uh, we have uh, uh, grown about 500 percent uh, just in the year of 2019. Uh, we do like multi-billion dollar um, um, uh, payments uh, in and around uh, the country, largely in India, also outside. Um, uh, so very, very profitable. We are growing extremely high. Uh, yes, like many other organizations, we are hit by COVID, but uh, that doesn't have, that doesn't stop us uh, from growing. As as the economy is reviving, as things are growing fine, um, uh, it hasn't really stopped uh, a lot of things. So. Uh, a journey thus far, we started in 2015 uh, with the launch of a payment gateway. Uh, demonetization hit us uh, uh, in terms of innovation. We were the first, or we were one of the first companies. Uh, actually, we are one. Of, we are the only company to have actually done something called as EPOS, which is basically an electronic pause uh, in the year 2016. Uh, this was done, I think, uh, our our then and now Prime Minister uh, when he announced the demonetization on 8th or 6th of uh, uh, November. This was a Wednesday or a Thursday, if I remember it right. By the following Monday, we were actually out with an EPOS. That's the level of innovation. And we couldn't have achieved that. Um, the reason I'm coding that is we couldn't have achieved that with without the support of um, some of the stack that we're using, which is largely dependent on open source stack. Uh, first to launch again, uh, UPA payments. Uh, UPA is again an open platform, uh, open framework, uh, for those of you who do not know. Uh, subscriptions, uh, we created something called as eNash, which is based on Aadhaar. Aadhaar, again, being an open open framework. Um, you play 2.0, which is again an open framework, uh, and then we launched, uh, you know, like I said, we launched uh, Razorpay X, which is a neo banking platform. A uh, bunch of products uh, like payment pages, instant refunds, a uh, couple of acquisitions that we have done. Again, um, uh, a company called Opfin, which is uh, uh, which is around, uh, you know, how do you sort of uh, disburse uh, or work with, for example, um, um, salaries and uh, settlements, etc. And Third Watch, which is largely around cash on risk, a uh, cash on delivery risk, uh, which is a risk platform. Uh, we had very recently in 2020, we had opened up uh, payments for freelancers. That is you and I as individuals can actually go ahead, sign up as a merchant on, on Razorpay and, and start actually doing our own uh, work um, in any fashion. Um, and your banking for current accounts and, co and commercial cards for uh, largely for merchants. We are a B2B platform. Most of our work happens on um, you know the merchant side of the story. Now, to give you some numbers, uh, you know, this is this is actually a number that we actually drew out at, uh, uh, at the mid of the pandemic, which is somewhere in the month of uh, June, uh, June-ish. So at the month of uh, June, uh, which is probably one of the lowest times uh, economically across the world, uh, this was currently our number, which is we are, we are on an average, you're doing about 15 to 20,000 transactions, a request per second. Uh, our peak transactions anywhere go to around 3,000 transactions. Our fraud to sale ratio is at 0.02%. Uh, 70 million payment requests, like I said, this is in the month of July, 70 million payment requests in the month of July, 
uh, we have largely been having a fairly decent uptime uh, in, in all those three months. Uh, hundreds of microservices and about 1,500 deployments per month. And, and mind you, these numbers are going to be useful for us uh, when we talk about the role of open source. And that's why uh, uh, you know we're presenting these numbers to sort of help you understand uh, some of the scale and operational challenges that we deal with and how um, you know the, the community uh, uh, has helped us actually move forward to achieve uh, this particular scale, right? Now, before we go into the role of uh, uh, you know open source uh, in in the context of fintechs and Razorpay, I'd like to throw a few questions. Okay, so these are some statements that I'm sort of making, uh, and for those who are there in the group, um, it's a it's a it's sort of a trivia question. So Red Hat acquired uh, Red Hat was acquired by uh, IBM. I'm sorry, it's a typo there. Red Hat was acquired by IBM. Uh, can somebody guess by how much? Any 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 numbers? Um, any specific numbers? No, no idea. Okay. Yeah. Thirty-two billion. That's the estimated figure. Um, any figures on MongoDB's uh, net worth? I I hope you know what is Red Hat. I, I don't have to. I hope I don't have to explain what is Red Hat. But yeah, MongoDB's numbers. What MongoDB's net worth? Okay, that's about four billion. Uh, Elastic Elastic Company, the the company that 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 builds and works Elastic Search. Uh, that's the IPO values are at about six billion. Uh, Cloud around Hortonworks, two companies which have largely worked on the Hadoop uh, space when they merge together, their net market cap is around four billion. Uh, alongside this, we are talking about evolution of other players like Confluent, um, HashiCorp, DataBricks, Kong, and a whole slew of companies that are building not just open source stack but also making money on top of open source stack one and two also creating consulting so uh, job opportunities in terms of building consulting like hortonworks and cloud are great examples of something uh, uh you know that happened at yahoo uh you know uh ex employees of yahoo had built and been part of especially hortonworks built and been part of the hadoop journey have actually gone in to create consulting firms um, um on top of uh, on top of some of these platforms and i think the largest uh, uh you know uh, support uh, or the largest uh, light was when Microsoft acquired GitHub and uh, pretty much sort of announced uh, uh, Satya Nadella, the, 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 the CEO of Microsoft, that announced uh, saying uh, their significant contribution into open source and how Microsoft is sort of opening up some of those platforms. So all of this, um, all of this, um, uh, the reason I'm saying this, all of this is, is going in the direction where uh, the world is no more, um, you know, tied to a bunch of, you know, lagoons or islands where code and software is getting built. Uh, it, it's completely getting opened out. Uh, and a lot of people do not have uh, fear that you know code is uh, uh, you know has got any uh, 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 you know things that it should not be uh, uh, shared or commented upon or uh, absorbed etc 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 i mean that's the premise of 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 these numbers and 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 this is a study this is a survey that was sort of conducted uh, in about 2018 uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, so the first uh, this this particular block that you're seeing in the first block is is basically the list of companies which have greater than ten thousand employees and their uh, level of adoption of open source. So that's about seventy seven percent. About eight percent are thinking, um, uh, you know, in terms of adopting open source in their uh, ecosystem. And I think this number should be significantly significantly di different um, now. Uh, if we had if somebody had to go back to run these numbers. And uh, the 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 other part here, which is which is uh, uh, the graph here below, uh, is for those organizations which have not uh, which have not reached uh, uh, you know um, uh, th that number, and uh, in across variety of different segments, whether it is to do with uh, uh, telecom, whether it is to do with financial services, etc., etc., etc. There are certain challenges in financial services. We'll come to that as we spoke as we speak, and how actually we are able to uh, solve some of those challenges. Now. The additional aspect that sort of comes along when we are talking about uh, open source, right, is is around innovation innovation opportunities. Um, and what I mean by innovation opportunities is uh, this, right? So if you look at some evolution uh, in the last uh, decade or so, and all of this, most of this, these these things that I'm talking about is in the last decade or so. Um, uh, you know, uh, somebody we were all running on our web servers with with Apache, and somebody came in and said that okay, it's not going to solve my 10,000 requests per second, which is which is classically called as a C to 10K problem. Uh, the evolution of Nginx, uh, and then subsequently the evolution of uh, something like traffic. Uh, if you look at messaging, for example, we didn't know a decade back. Nobody knew what messaging was. Uh, everything was on file system, right? Uh, people had uh, glorious NFS servers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, on which they operated. And then somebody decided that, hey, if you have to make services resilient, it, it was either databases or file systems. If you had to make things resilient, uh, you had to actually introduce certain constructs like messaging software, 
um uh, and and then that led to for example the evolution of rabidmq kafka and now today we're talking pulsar uh, in fact kafka uh, there's quite a few documentation in terms of how they arrived at uh, at, at uh, you know the design of kafka itself uh, again big data i i come from yahoo i was uh, i was part of the, uh, some of the original uh, uh, design and implementation work at uh, you know when we were thinking about hadoop uh, we had to go through about 6 to 7 iterations before we actually uh, so to speak invented slash discovered hadoop um, and it it did not happen overnight i mean it it forced us to sort of uh, uh, you know build things that we never thought uh, were possible before a and forced us business actually forced us to build things and and the beauty is most of these innovations that happen have happened because of not because of some uh, individual intent it happened because of the fact that there was a pure classic business need uh, you know which which led to this evolution because again yahoo couldn't scale uh, uh, you know beyond a certain point and and then and that's why we had to for example uh, create discover uh, hadoop and languages sorry okay uh, languages if you look at it again uh, evolution of golang rust kotlin uh, ballerina uh, platform and containerization for example uh, google had been running uh, borg uh, in its in its ecosystem for uh, several years and then eventually they realized that you know they just had to open source this uh, kubernetes evolved uh, docker evolved uh, rkt is again uh, for those of you who do not know is another uh, uh, containerization um, uh, engine of sorts um if you again look at uh, databases i mean traditionally we're talking about uh, oltp databases in in the, in the world of mysql uh, and uh, postgres um uh, one one big uh, alibaba sale for example gave birth to something called as uh, tadb which is the htap data store uh, and then it lead, and 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 there were potentially other kinds of uh, ways in which data needs to be explored whether you're looking at a document store like mongodb whether you're looking at uh, uh, you know other forms of relational databases or you're looking at key value stores like redis or you're looking at graphql stores uh you know all of this evolution did not happen because of just pure uh, you know individual intent all of this happened because of an inherent business need and all of this couldn't have happened uh you know the business need could have persisted but could, could couldn't have happened if there wasn't a larger community initiative and if there isn't a larger need to not just build it for themselves but also put it out in the open uh for enough uh, adoption for enough migration for enough uh you know variety of different uh, uh innovations that that sort of exist uh security uh, service discovery uh, monitoring and um, you know we 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 have some interesting numbers for example in terms of the kind of monitoring that we do we are as it stands at this particular point of time uh, at razor pay we are at any at, on an average day we are sort of doing trillions of data points uh, in our monitoring ecosystem right um, so all of this uh, is to give you sort of uh, you know the, the come out of innovation that has sort of happened in uh, in the last one decade and uh, how uh, Uh, companies have sort of uh, not just absorbed it, but also participating in it. I mean, if you look at uh, whether you look at Google, whether you look at Facebook, whether you look at LinkedIn, um, some of the Uber, uh, Netflix, some of the largest organizations sort of participate collectively to solve the problem, not just for their needs, but also for the entire community's needs, right? And the reason they do that is, um, uh, you know, it 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 by opening up their platforms, by opening up some of their uh, technologies. it sort of gives a larger perspective for many others to sort of come in and participate so their perspective in terms of how they are looking at it could have solved only their problem but by opening up the ecosystem uh, not only are they uh, solving the problem for themselves but letting other companies other individuals other players to sort of come participate build uh, and move on uh, all right and and contribute back uh, uh, for for the larger growth uh, by itself right so with that in mind and with all of this innovation in mind right and we uh, to just to give a perspective at razor pay we are uh, pretty much uh, have one or the other of these technologies in place uh, uh, you know at different uh, uh, you know at different kinds of uh, uh, stacks and technologies so to speak right uh, very specifically now uh, what's the role of open source for example uh, in fintech now fintech unfortunately or fortunately uh, is a very regulated space right so uh, small changes that you do it it raises eyebrows across the entire ecosystem <coughs> when i say ent entire ecosystem um, on a, on any given day on any given month for example we at least have a couple of audits uh, either done by banks uh, either done by uh, external parties uh, either done by uh, uh, you know rbi or either done by other regulatory bodies like pci Uh, SOC, uh, HIPAA, ISO, etc., etc. So at any given month, we at least have one or the other audit uh, that that sort of goes on, right? 
and uh, the problem uh, that happens in 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 a, in a in a regulated environment is that your auditor sort of needs to understand and be convinced about the fact that yes you are in fact investing in the right technologies uh, for the auditors from the auditor's perspective uh, there's a large focus for example in terms of security and compliance right now how does open source actually solve this particular problem for us interestingly because the code is open because everything is out there in the open uh, you know it's 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 up for scrutiny and 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 and, and uh, you know you have enough cve vulnerabilities you have enough other ways in which information can be sort of derived quite easily it is not just it's not just left up to any white box testing you can actually do black box testing uh, uh, you know if you have the necessary muscle and need and and some of our environments uh, have to do that whether we like it or not uh, because of the regulatory reasons right so net net uh, what we can achieve for a large all practical purposes is that we can actually keep the auditor happy uh, by largely adopting open source stack because um, heck we can prove whatever we, whatever the auditor needs to need us need us to prove provided of course we have chosen the right uh, um, uh, stack technology uh, software etc right uh, in terms of support uh, i would like to use this term called as collective intelligence um, and uh, there's a there's a famous book about collective intelligence as well so um, the the interesting uh, aspect around this is that uh, it's not just one individual's problem or one organization's problem anymore right the entire community is sort of working uh to solve their problems along with solve your problems and a uh, good open source projects reason are uh, reasonably well connected are, are are reasonably very supportive uh, reasonably reasonably take up uh, issues on priority and sort of try to solve and also help you for example uh, file the respective prs etc etc to fix the problems that sort of uh, arises right uh, the next next point is, for example, in terms of operational excellence, which is the OPEX part of it. Um, I know uh, things around scale, things around resiliency, things around reliability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like I said, again, purely because of the bliss that the code is open, uh, even if somebody is not fixing it, uh, you can actually take it, fix it, and and move forward. Uh, cost, of course, um, um, uh, the 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 F of us, uh, it's it's largely free, uh, right? Uh, so you don't have to spend uh, dollars of, of of investment in terms of cost and licensing. Uh, provided, of course, you choose the right licenses. Um, and uh, in terms of team um, cultural aspects, you know, the, the, so Karan, I think, mentioned an interesting aspect, which is, for example, because uh, things are sort of open out there, right? The the, the adoption and the uh, uh, evangelization is quite uh, straightforward, right? So if I, for example, go ahead and contribute uh, in an open source project, uh, automatically I have, um, you know, either through my GitHub stars or through other places, my, my, my potential resume sort of uh, builds up because I have enough contribution out there to prove, uh, which is which is quite visible for anybody else to sort of look at in terms of what my contribution has been, um, so to speak, right? Uh, and not just that internally as an organization when you're sort of adopting uh, open source, it also sort of opens up you know other ways in which culturally you sort of share code even within teams, even within um, um, uh, even within projects, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? So there is a certain level of openness that you're sort of drawing out implicitly because of the fact that you're sort of adopting some of these uh, principles as part of your software development life cycle. And, um, uh, uh, and last but not the least, the innovation aspect, some of the innovation aspects that we spoke, uh, none of this couldn't have happened uh, without uh, the advent and without, for example, the community and without, for example, the potential need and the actual interest of a lot of people actually coming in to solve a very similar problem. And some of these problems, mind you, are not just the problems that one organization faces. Today, uh, uh, we can safely say around 60-70% uh, of, of web servers are can potentially run on Nginx or can potentially run on uh, traffic or Apache or whatever it is, right? So there's a, there's, there's enough uh, um, you know stuff that is sort of going on in terms of uh, uh, the the contribution and the, uh, and the and the communication aspects as well. But but having said that, right? So some of these challenges that, that sort of exist. <coughs> Sorry, some of these challenges that sort of exist in the in the fintech space, I think, is a beautiful mapping uh, that, that the open source uh, community sort of uh, 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 brings out to uh, us uh, and sort of helps us move forward uh, in the right uh, rightful ways of, of solving the problem, uh, rather than you know us thinking about in silos. Uh, we are we are coming together as a community to actually solve uh, some of the most common problems, and and that is very very. Uh, interesting uh, uh, in its in its own way uh, when it comes to very specifically when it comes to fintech. Now specifically with respect to um, raises the pay, like I already mentioned, right? And, and I say or use the word almost. Uh, the reason I use the word almost is that we still have certain dependencies on our cloud vendors like AWS or Google or whatever it is. Yes, we do. So you have to use uh, unfortunately certain unfortunately unfortunately we have to use certain technologies that the cloud providers use. So barring that, uh, pretty much the entire stack is on open source. We have a bunch of open source projects already out there. Uh, um, the the GitHub uh, Razorpay is the right place for 
uh, uh, you know, for anyone who's interested in either uh, using or contributing back into some of the work that we have already done. As we speak, uh, we have plans to open source some in-house frameworks. So, um, you know, at, at Razorpay, for example, uh, one of the biggest challenges um, uh, is, for example, uh, a centralized framework which allows us to integrate with our gateways, partners, banks, etc., etc., etc. So, usually, this particular process is a very mundane process where uh, you know, we'll have to. There is a lot of back and forth that sort of goes in, and uh, potentially, uh, you know, you have to almost sort of rewrite the code in multiple places for the same kind of um, 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 aspects. Whether it's to do with socket breaking, uh, whether it's to do with, for example, your JSON parsing, XML parsing, uh, your SOAP redirections, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all of those things have to be done uh, in different places. So, what we have actually tried to do is we have actually tried to build an integration framework where um, uh, think of it like uh, Apache Camel plus plus in some sense. Uh, uh, an integration framework where what you're trying to do is uh, it doesn't require really an engineer to come and build these build these uh, gateway integrations. We can potentially uh, you know have a, a UI of sorts which allows uh, anybody to sort of come in and and and, and define a configuration file and uh, being able to test the integration and being able to deploy the integration uh, uh, per se. And now, why is this going to be useful outside of Razor Pay? Because of the fact that it's a it's 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 a general integration framework. It's it's a general service integration framework. It's not. It's not really uh, just specified to Razorpay's uh, viewpoints. It's a general integration framework. Um, in addition to that, we basically have uh, had to build our own notification platform. Again, it's very, very generically built, uh, whether it's to do with webhooks, whether it's to do with SMSs, whether it's to do with WhatsApp, whether it's to do with emails, whether it's to do with a bunch of things. Again, we didn't have uh, any such technology that sort of existed out there specifically for our needs. But the way we have tried to build it is to address it extremely generically uh, with a plug and play model. Um, Go Foundation, we as a company uh, have uh, uh, about a year and a half to back. We have basically started rewriting our entire architecture in, uh, in Golang, uh, which forced us to, for example, build uh, a reasonably um, uh, slightly opinionated, but not so opinionated uh, uh, microservices framework, uh, uh, something on the lines of Go, uh, Go Toolkit and et cetera. Again, we evaluated Go Toolkit on a variety of other platforms, but unfortunately, many of those things did not fit our build. So this is something that we're looking at. We're doing a lot of work on observability. I mean, I gave you sort of numbers, uh, uh, 2.2 trillion, um, uh, 2.2 trillion build, uh, uh, events uh, that we that you're seeing uh, in terms of our metrics. We're doing quite an amount of work in terms of observability. Um, so some of those platforms that you're building um, are are plans in plans for uh, about, uh, you know open sourcing. Um, uh, we are also working on self-healing systems, which is which is true with the AI ops. Um, and we have some um, initial work that we are also doing on a service bus, um, you know, something like a Kafka slash Pulsar plus plus, uh, specifically for solving microservices problem, um, uh, microservices communication patterns. Um, uh, some of these things, ideally, like I said, right, we would we would have liked to have contributed an existing open source platform, but unfortunately, none exists today. Uh, so the way we would like to do this is also some of you know these are some of the problems that we are facing, and the way we would like to do this is. If there are similar organizations which are working on some uh, some of these interesting problems or some similar problems like we are working on, we would love to work and and, and contribute back to the community with them. Uh, we are also contributing besides some of these things. We are also contributing to you know existing open source uh, 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 frameworks and platforms. Uh, quite recently, for example, one of our engineers went ahead to for example fix uh, 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 and contribute some of the right consistency issues. It was a complicated problem. Uh, some of the right consistency issues on Cassandra, very specifically for Kong use cases. Uh, we have quite a few contributions on the Kubernetes community. As